God laid it upon my heart to do a study on Malachi. And I think I put a ribbon bookmark in that NIV there so that it'd make it easier for you. But it's the last book of the Old Testament. And I thought I would give you a, while everybody's making sure they've got Malachi, we made a few changes. I've, I'm hoping to get Dave to read from the King James Version. And I'm hoping to get Josie to read from the New International Version. And then I'll read from the Amplified. And we'll see what we can get out of this. <clears throat> but I wanted to give you a little introduction on it. So I'm going to call this, this a study on Malachi. And we'll start with chapter 1 and see how far we get. And go from there. But the author is a man by the name of Malachi who was considered a prophet. And um, when we go through this, we will kind of get an idea of the conditions at that time, which I understand were similar to um, the conditions in Nehemiah's time. Um, and it's written in quite a forceful and unusual way. It Part of it uh, portrays, it's kind of like him having God speak through him and tell to the people. And um, it's kind of a... Um, a graphic picture of the period of the Old Testament history, which means the way it was before Christ came. And so um, that's what we're going to focus on. And uh, when you read through it, I guess the thing that really hits you the hardest is um, called the key text which is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. And it's, Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? So, in my way of thinking, it's God's way of putting his people in their place. Because we as people tend to think if we are doing certain things that we're pleasing God. Well, sometimes we're not especially if we get too pious and religious about it. Uh, so, anyway, let's, um, we're going to go to chapter 1. And, Dave, if you'll read verses 1 through 5, then I'll have Josie read verses 1 through 5 in the NIV, and I'll read them in the Amplified. Okay. Malachi verse 1, chapter 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hate Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Okay, Josie. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Jacob loved Esau, hated. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? The Lord says, Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his mountains 
into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Okay. The oracle, burdensome message of the word of the Lord to Israel through my messenger Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. <coughs> but you say, How? And in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau, Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, or Israel. But in comparison with my love for Jacob, I have hated Esau, or Edom, and I have made his mountains a wasteland, and have given his inheritance to the jackals of the wilderness. Though impoverished, Edom says, We have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, They may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory, the people against whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your own eyes will see this, and you will say, The Lord is great and shall be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Now before I make comments, do either one of you have comments you want to make on these first verses? Dave's shaking his head no. How about you, Josie? No. <laughs> I just want to bring out the fact that the Old Testament was a time of the law. And the law was used to show us what pleases God and that we of ourselves cannot please God. However, there were people back in the Old Testament that did their best to according to their knowledge to obey God and do things that would please God and he brings out an example in Esau and in Jacob <clears throat> when when they gave offerings to the Lord it's my understanding that Jacob gave his best and he gave of an animal sacrifice so blood which, when you read scriptures, <clears throat> that was the requirement for an offering, for the shedding of blood uh, at that time. And um, Esau, you know, the animal sacrifice was basically a sacrifice from God's provision, the animal. Now you say, well, God helped provide the plants too and and Esau gave uh, you know he was a farmer and he gave uh, of his plants well <clears throat> the plants didn't shed blood <laughs> so that so it wasn't that big of a sacrifice uh, on the plants you know um, in God's eyes and Esau got mad at Jacob because Jacob, his was accepted and Esau's wasn't. Well, um, there's blessings that come with doing things the right way according to the Lord, Jesus Christ and God. Um, but those blessings are withdrawn. Um you just not you don't receive the blessings by being disobedient let's put it that way that's a little bit easier to to understand um you know and god tells us throughout the scriptures you know if you are obedient you will have favor you will be blessed if you are disobedient you will be cursed and you will not have favor so um that kind of goes along with this, you know, um, where Edom or Esau says, well, you know, um, we've been beaten down, but we will return and rebuild. And uh, God says, uh, they may build, but I will tear it back down. He's not going to honor and give favor 
to someone who has on purpose been rebellious and wanted to do it their way instead of God's way. And, um, you know, it's just like with our children. We, God does have um, unconditional love, but love does not mean you accept the wrongdoing. If you really love your child when they disobey, you will discipline them. And um, God is that way too. And because I use the word hate in here, it makes people think that he didn't love Esau. But he did have a, an unconditional love for Esau, but he really despised the disobedience of Esau. And because he was a perfect God and, and Jesus' blood had not been shed to... Uh, cover that imperfection he could not look upon that and accept it at all and so anyway um and then when Esau killed or not wait a minute um I might be getting my stories mixed up but anyway um when he didn't do things the right way um I think I'm getting it mixed up with Cain and Abel. But um, when he didn't do things the right way, God could not bless him because he went against the law. But the Old Testament does show us that we need a Savior uh, because no matter how hard we try, we find ourselves making the wrong decisions if left only with our human reasoning and thinking. All right, let's go to verse 6 and... Hmm. Let's go from uh, 6 to 9, through 9. Mr. Dave... father and servant his master if then I be a father where is mine honor and if I be a master where is my fear saith the Lord of hosts unto you O priest that despise my name and ye say where have we despised thy name ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar and ye say where have we polluted thee in that ye say table of the Lord is contemptible. Am I going to nine or seven? Yeah, you're, uh, you're on seven right now, and you're going to read to the end of nine. Verse eight, and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, it is not evil. And if ye offer the lame and sick, it is not evil. Offer it now unto the governor, and to thy governor will I be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. In verse 9, and now I pray ye, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will ye regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, Josie. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor? Where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty, it is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we showed contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar, but you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Al Almighty? Now employ God to be gracious to us. With such of offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. 
A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then, if I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is the reverent fear and respect due me? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How, and in what way have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, How have we defiled you? By thinking that the table of the Lord is contemptible and may be despised. When you priests present the blind animals for sacrifice, is this not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer such a thing as a blind or a lame or a sick animal to your governor as a gift or payment for your taxes. Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you graciously, saith the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering from your hand as an imperfect animal for sacrifice, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Anyone want to comment on those? No? How about you, Dave? No? Okay. It's quite interesting. He's bringing out the fact that we treat a human being who's considered over other people more important and more worthy of a good gift than God himself. And they're dishonoring him by bringing him their leftovers, their undesirable stuff, their broken things, their lame things, their wounded things. They're not healthy. They're, it's not a true sacrifice when we didn't really want it in the first place because of the condition it's in. I mean, is that a good gift? At Christmas time, would you go out? the junkyard and buy a bunch of broken toys and give them to your kids would you give the broken stuff then the, from the junkyard to your friends and relatives as a as a gift for their birthday no you wanted to show them that you were give show them some honor and some favor and we're just human we don't deserve half the favor God deserves. He's perfect. And so he was trying to make a point here. You are not giving of your best to the master. You are dishonoring me by giving me your leftovers and your unwanted stuff. And so, and we can apply it nowadays, you know, if, uh, to, you know, Whatever we are giving to the Lord, we need to give the best that we can give. One person can give more than another, perhaps, but um, and and that's not to be a sh putting shame on the one that can't give as much. But if you're not giving God the good stuff, you're giving Him the bad stuff. You're dishonoring Him. <coughs> Okay, let's go and read verses 10 through 14 in chapter 1. I can't hear you, Dave. Verses 10 through 14. But you're going to have to speak up. <laughs> These fans are louder than you are. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> King James Version, verse 10 of Malachi, chapter 1. Who is there even among you that would shut doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, 
my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick, thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male and a, a voleth, and sacrifice saith unto the Lord a corrupt thing, for I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Verse 10, International. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from the rising of the, s the setting of the sun. In every place, Incense and pure offering, offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying of the Lord's table, it is defiled and, and of its food, it is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifice, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is a cheat who has acceptable mail in his flock and vows to give it, and then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Amplified. Oh, that there were even one among you whose duty it is to minister to me, who would shut the gates so that you would not kindle fire on my altar uselessly with an empty, worthless pretense. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. In every place incense is going to be offered in my name. And a grain offering that is pure for my name shall be great among the nations. But you priests profane it when you say the table of the Lord is defiled and as for its fruit its food is to be despised. You also say how tiresome this is and you disdainfully sniff at it says the Lord of hosts and you bring what was taken by robbery and the lame or the sick animals this you bring as an offering. Should I receive it with pleasure from your hands says the Lord? But cursed is the swindler swindler who has a male in his flock and vows to offer it but sacrifices to the Lord a blemished or diseased thing for I am a great king says the Lord of hosts my name is to be reverently and greatly feared among the nations any comments no Okay, I have one. I noticed in these verses, he's taken it a step farther. It's not just about what they bring as a sacrifice. It's their attitude about bringing the sacrifice. The attitude is, sh it should be a joyful attitude that we're glad because we're serving a awesome God and not one that makes us feel tiresome for the sacrifice. We're not to bring sacrifice that that we have stolen. I've heard people say, you know, that they 
Well, I've heard of them. I haven't heard them say it, but I've heard of people who go out and maybe rob a bank or something and think that if they pay a 10% tithe on what they robbed, that they're okay with God about it. No, he doesn't want stolen goods. Um, he doesn't want sick or lame goods. He wants good goods. You, When you're showing honor, you bring good gifts. Uh, the widow's might. That's all she had to live on, and she gave it all. It wasn't much, but she gave it all. That's why he showed so much honor over that. And, you know, um, it's when he can, he can bless us in spite of what we give when we give of our best. And that's what he's trying to get across. And when we do it with a good attitude, a good mindset, and when we're not trying to trick somebody, you know, the, um, when you try to do things in, in front of others to make them think you're a great person when really you're not doing what you promised the Lord you'd do anyway, and then you're doing it with the wrong attitude because you're not supposed to give unto the Lord to please other people. You're supposed to give unto the Lord to please God and to show him honor and respect. So, in, the, in verse 14, <clears throat> it says, Cursed is a cheat who has accepted bull mail in the flock and vows to give it. And if you have, like, your son thing and you vow to give it, if you had it, you'd vow to give it and... And then when you get it, you don't give it, you know. That's another example, I guess. Yeah, that kind of implies, too, that if you're very, very poor and you just give the best that you have, but the best that you have is not the best somebody else has, God is going to honor you for doing the best that you can. And so he's not trying to be unreasonable. He's trying to show the difference between giving honor and not giving honor. And, and some people say, well, if I have it, if I had it, I'd give it. And then they don't even give n nothing, you know. Uh, right. Or they, you know, they just waiting on the Lord to give it to them so they can give it. And some of them and have that's been. that's not the way it works. Right. And some of them have been blessed. And. And After saying that, yeah. and then didn't do what they said they would do. And that's very dangerous to do yeah, that. that is. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Um, Dave, will you read chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 in the King James, please? saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and spend, uh, spread dung upon your faces even, the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear of uh, wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law of his mouth at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law. 
Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Okay, Dosi. And now this abomination, abomination, how do you say that? Abomination. Abomination mm -hmm. is for you, O priest, if you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will be rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the awful, awful, from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this abomination, so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him a covenant of life and peace, and I give gave them to him this call for reverence and he reverenced me and stood in awe of my name true instructions was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips he walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge and from his mouth men should seek instruction because he is a messenger of the Lord Almighty but you have turned from the way and by your teaching you have caused many to stumble you have violated the covenant with Levi says the Lord Almighty so I have cursed you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law Okay, now, now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings on the people. Indeed, I have cursed them already, because you are not taking it to heart. Be behold, I am going to rebuke your seed, and I will spread refuge on refuse on your faces, the refuse from the festival offerings, and you will be taken away with it in disgrace. Then you will know without any doubt that I have sent this new commandment to you, priests, that my covenant may continue with Levi, the priestly tribe, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with Levi was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he and the priest feared me and stood in reverent awe of my name. <coughs> True instruction was in Levi's mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from wickedness. For the lips of the priest should guard and preserve knowledge of my law. And the people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, priests, you have turned from the way and have caused many to stumble by your instruction in the law. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I have also made you despised and abased before all people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality to people and in your administration of the law. Any comments? Well, what I get out of this <clears throat> is the priests themselves were not doing or teaching the honorable thing to do for the Lord. They were not teaching correct things. They were showing partiality. I mean, if you gave a lot of money into their church, um, 
they would let you get away with things that they wouldn't let the regular person who didn't have that much money get away with. They were being partial. And God's law doesn't say, you know, like on the Ten Commandments and so, such, it doesn't say you, that if you're rich, you don't have to honor your parents or you don't have to refrain from killing, murdering somebody. I mean, it doesn't say it that way. That what is the law for one person is the law for all. And um, so he, he was also letting them know that he held the teachers and the priests and, the, and so forth responsible for the people because they were not instructing them correctly. So he was causing them to stumble and do wrong in the sight of the Lord because he, he w the priests were not doing what God, they were not teaching what God expected them to teach. And they knew. It wasn't because they didn't know. They were choosing the wrong, you know, f for whatever reason. And so therefore he was going to... Be, to cause them to have shame, just as if somebody took and wiped cow manure all over their face, causing them to be degraded and ashamed because that's what they were doing to God and God's word and his law. And that was not right to do that. Um, he let them know that the priests are supposed to guard and preserve his law, not abuse it and misuse it. Um, the people were supposed to street seek instruction from the priest, but what good was it if he was giving false or bad instructions? You know, he's going to hold them extra accountable, not only for their own, his, the priest's own behavior, but for what they were teaching the people that followed after them. <clears throat> so... I guess we are ready. We might get through the whole book of Malachi if we keep going at this rate. <laughs> um, all right. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 through 16, if you would, Dave. his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master of a scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that authoreth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this hath ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord, with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, inasmuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant, and did not make, and did not he make one, yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, said that he hateth putting away, for one covenant.
covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Okay. Josie, International Version, ver uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Judah, unfaithful. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A dis detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves my by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why. It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his, and why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garments, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Okay. <clears throat> in the Amplified, verse, ten, starting in verse 10, do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers with God? Judah has been treacherous, disloyal, and it, an and repulsive act has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanct sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob to the last man who do this evil thing, awake and aware, even the one who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with your own weeping and sighing, because the Lord no longer regards your offering or, your, or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he reject it? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your marriage companion and the wife of your covenant made by your vows. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while seeking a godly offering? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong and violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, keep watch on your spirit, so that you do not deal treacherously with your wife. Any comments on that? Y'all are being so quiet tonight. <laughs> well, he's... Is this really talking about the church? It makes... it When he's dealing with husbands and wives, mm -hmm. he they also are symbolic of the church. Yeah. And the dealings with the church um, and those put over the church. Yeah. And I know um, when I read this, I also notice a bit of attitude. It's like it's 
besides them wanting to divorce their wives, basically it's doing wrong by a person that you've made a covenant with, your wife or your husband. Doing wrong by them is displeasing to him because you made the covenant, the covenant between the two of you and God. Yeah. So it's coming against God as well. And, um, and he's a jealous God. You don't want to be marrying somebody that's dedicated to a different God. Yeah. That's not pleasing to him. That's just as offensive to him as offering the blemished sacrifices on the altar. It doesn't give him honor. It doesn't give him pleasure. He doesn't like it. You're not obeying his laws. You're being rebellious. You're wanting to do it your way and have your way. You're not wanting to work on doing it the right way. And that displeases God. And when he mentions um, who covers his garment with wrong and violence, I can't help but wonder if he's referring to an abusive husband or wife in some cases. You know, um, that is wrong to be abusive of another human being, especially one you've made a covenant before God with. <laughs> but, I mean, it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And, and so if you think your prayers are not being answered, there's something wrong. Uh, either they aren't being answered because there's something wrong in your life, or they're not being answered the way you think they should be answered, or, and so you don't think he's answering. Or perhaps he's saying, maybe later, not now. It's not a good timing. Or what you're asking of me to do does not line up with my word, my plan, my purpose for you. You know, and he's not trying to be mean. He's trying to be righteous and just. And a righteous and just God wants what's best for his people. So, okay. Wow. We're moving right along here. All right. Um, this next set of verses I would like us to examine is... Um, the last verse, 17 of chapter 2, on through to verse 5 of chapter 3. Dave? Verse 17 of chapter 2, and then on through chapter 3, 1 through 5. messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in behold he shall come saith the Lord of hosts but who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment and I will be a 
has witnessed against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, Josie. <clears throat> International chapter 2, verse 17 and 3, 1 through 5. <laughs> the day of judgment. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he pleased with them. And he is pleased with them. Or where is the Lord of justice? God of justice. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? who can stand where he appears, for he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will set as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will he will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and per perjurers against those who defraud defi laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. All right, and the Amplified. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Where is the the God of just, or by us asking, where is the God of justice? Well, if He gave us justice, we'd all be destroyed. <laughs> and and it's like, uh, what it, it's like they're doing what Satan did in the garden. They're saying what God says is not true. It's the opposite, you know. That and then and then they wonder how they have wearied Him. <laughs> they're still not following what he's instructing them to do he's still not doing they're still not doing right all right uh, behold i'm going to send my messenger and he will prepare and clear the way before me and the lord the messiah whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the lord of hosts verse 2 but who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap, which removes impurities and uncleanness. <coughs> so, he will, uh, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, the priests, and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord grain offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in ancient years. Then I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, and against those who oppress the laborer in his wa wages and widows and the fatherless, and against those who turn away <clears throat> the el el alien from his right and those who do not fear me with all filled uh, reverence, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> 
So he's going to clean out the dirt in all of us. <laughs> Any other comments? He's the only one that's worthy enough to clean out the dirt in all of us. All right. Well, we still have plenty of time, so let's read verse 6 through... Six through eight. King James Version, chapter three, verse six. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But he said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Uh, go on ahead and read. Hmm. 9 through 14. Verse 9. Ye are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. Herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been Stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God, and what profit it is that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Okay. Josie, 6 through 14, please. Robbing God, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, or, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In the tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. The whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tie in the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will pre prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will, will not cease cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is fruitful to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? For I am the Lord, I do not change, but remain faithful to my covenant with you. That is why you, O sons of Jacob, have not come to an end. 
Yet, from the days of your fathers, you have turned away from my statutes and ordinances, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings you have withheld. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, this whole nation. Bring all the tithes, the tenth, into the storehouse, so there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. Then I will rebuke the devourer, insects, and plague for your sake, and he will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field drop its grapes before harvest, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> uh, All nations shall call you happy and blessed, and you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, but you say, What have we spoken against you? Verse 14, you have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it if we keep his ordinances and walk around like mourners before the Lord of hosts? Any comments? It sounds to me, besides all the other things we've discussed, that they don't recognize when he does bless them and they're not grateful for when he blesses them and they don't do exactly according to what they're supposed to do when it does come to giving unto the Lord. You know, it's kind of like when when they were complaining they didn't have any food and they were out in the wilderness, God rained down manna. Well, they were grateful at first, and then all of a sudden they stopped being grateful and they started complaining about the things God was doing for them. You know, I mean, really? <laughs> but that's what human nature tends to want to do, even though we know better. And then we turn around and we get mad at God for not blessing us the way we think he we should be blessed. Well, that didn't make a whole lot of common sense, does it? <laughs> All right, now we're going to start verse 15 and go through 18. I think we're going to get finished with Malachi before we leave today. <laughs> All right, Dave. Um, James Version, verse 15. And now we call are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, and in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return, and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God, and him that serveth him not. Okay, Josie, starting with 15, please. Okay, but now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenged God escaped. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasure possession, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. 
All right, the Amplified, starting with it, verse 15. So now we call the arrogant happy and blessed. Evildoers are exalted and prosper, and when they test God, they escape unpunished. Then those who feared the Lord with awe-filled reverence spoke to one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who fear or respect the Lord with an attitude of reverence and respect, and who esteemed his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day when I publicly recognize them and openly declare them to be my own possession, that is, my very special treasure. And I will have compassion on them and spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you will gain distinguished then you will, get, will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Any comments on that? Okay. Well, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. Um, God looks upon the person with favor who serves him, who honestly serves him with a good attitude and desire to please the, God, the Lord. He is considered righteous because he's do, trying to serve God God's way. He's not trying to do things his own way. He knows that God's in control. God knows best. Father knows best. <laughs> and and so God blesses him because of that. And he's going to bless them publicly to help everybody recognize the difference between the one who serves God willingly and the one who does not. All right, we only have six verses to go that's left. So, Dave, let's just do all of chapter 4. King James Version, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow as grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the, in the day that I shall do this, saith Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dread, dead, dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. International Version, um, Chapter 4, The Day of the Lord. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and ev every evil doer will be stubble, and that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who re reverend my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Haram. Haram for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah 
before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant, proud, self-righteous, haughty, <coughs> and every evil, evil doer shall be stubble, and the day that is coming shall set them on fire, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But you who fear my name with awe-filled reverence, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forward and leap joyfully like calves released from the stall. You will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember with thoughtful concern the law of Moses my servant, the statues and the ordinances which I commanded him on Mount Oreb to give to all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, a reconciliation produced by repentance, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse, a complete destruction. Looks like he's going to take the bad people out. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. Anybody else got a comment? Okay, go for it. Jesus was the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and ever since then, every day is the day of the Lord. In, in, in everyone's life, you know, whatever. And, uh, It reminded me of today as well. I, I want to, in closing, um, and I hope she doesn't mind, I don't think she will, uh, me reading something that um, Joyce Meyer had written in regards to Malachi. If I had to briefly summarize the theme of the book of Malachi, I would say it is religion versus relationship. While other books near the end of the Old Testament encourage the reconstruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Malachi writes after the temple has been rebuilt. Other prophets hoped the temple would give the Jews a place to worship God, restoring honor for God among the people. Unfortunately, once the temple was complete, their worship was superficial and not from the heart. Neither the priests nor the people worshipped with right attitudes or with actions based on sincere love for God. Mere religion may give people a sense of satisfying some kind of spiritual requirement, but only genuine relationships with God bring true peace, joy, and fulfillment. Let me encourage you to prioritize your relationship with God over everything and everyone else. And then f some winning thoughts from Malachi by Joyce. The length or eloquence of our prayers does not impress God. He wants us to pray in uncomplicated faith as the Holy Spirit leads us. The way to be victorious in your faith is to allow the Lord to purify and refine your heart. Tithing pays, paves the way for God's blessing in our lives, and the enemy is rebuked when we give faithfully to the Lord. Contend for reconciliation, the true heart of the gospel. So I thought... <clears throat> You know, Malachi reminded me of today, and it's like, uh, I believe there's going to come a time when 
the tares and the wheat are separated and the tares are burned up and so um, in, in sort of an indirect way that summarizes Malachi I think but God lets them know why they're always asking why well he, did, he gives them the answer to the why you know, it's kind of like a father to a disobedient son. Straighten up your act and do what you're supposed to do, and you won't have all these problems. <laughs> so, anyway, God bless you. And um, if there's any other comments or prayer requests, now's a good time to give them.